focus in collecting a Japanese superhero named Ultraman. And this is a 1966 TV series that really had an impact on me. I got a box of toys from an aunt who was living in Japan. And this is like around 1973. And when I opened up the box, it was full of like all these most crazy, amazing figures. And prior to that point, I was playing with like Major Matt Mason and G.I. Joe, and those were very much not colorful, whereas these figures that I opened up were like rainbow colored, they had chicken heads, they had like spaceman faces, and that really blew my mind and opened my mind up to collecting different types of toys from Japan. My name is Mark Nagata. Um, I would consider myself an artist first, but I also own a toy company called Max Toy Company, and uh, that's named after my son Max. Yes, I think I definitely am a collector. <laughs> in fact, uh, I worry that sometimes it might be bordering on hoarding in some cases, but uh, uh, you know, I try to keep it a, a nicely organized hoarding. <laughs> It may have started when I was about nine or ten, but I wasn't an active collector. Occasionally we would go to a Japan town in Los Angeles, which is where we were living at the time, and my dad would pick up, you know, one or two uh, monster figures or whatever, and those just became the toys that I was playing with. And, um, and I didn't really understand that there was a thing you could do, which is like collect them or, you know, buy one and keep one, you know, sealed in the package or whatever. So for me it was very much just about feeding my imagination and um, and I liked to draw at the time so I would use those toys and different drawings that, that I was doing. I could pinpoint pretty precisely in the late 80s to early 90s. I was living here in San Francisco and Japanese model kit stores started popping up and within those stores they started importing Ultraman figures and immediately I started recognizing these characters again and thinking like oh that's like the stuff I had in the 70s let me dig that out of the closet and um, and you know put them on a shelf and that's sort of the genesis of when I started really collecting and at that point the company that was producing those was called Bondi Toys so it was a lot of Bondi toys, uh, kind of in the 6 inch and uh, 10 to 12 inch size uh, figures that I was buying. And then my uh, girlfriend at the time, who is now my wife, and I would go to antique shows and then we would start rummaging through boxes looking for old Japanese toys and it sort of snowballed from there. One of the hallmarks of a vintage Japanese toy is that during that time period, so the 60s and 70s, when, when these toys that I like came out, a lot of the parents would write the kid's name on the foot. So it'd say Kenji or whatever, <laughs> whatever the kid's name was. And so subsequently over the years, a lot of the toys you'd find uh, in toy stores in Japan or even here in the US, if you flip them around, you'll see writing on the bottom of the foot or even on the back and it's the kid's name. Now, for me, I thought that was really cool. Um, it never turned me off. You know, there are other collectors who only want something that's like super uh, pristine and untouched or, you know, even mint and bag. Uh, but for me, I was fine with that. Like, I didn't mind if something had writing on the foot. And in fact, it led sort of a, a bit of charm to the figure. The original figures I got in 73, um, I still have most of them. Those would be like kind of the core, most treasured pieces for me because that's sort of what ignited all this stuff in me uh, in terms of collecting. Then branching out from that, as you get deeper into collecting and you find various guidebooks or even just going to Japan and looking in stores, you realize that there are so many other figures, so many other weird variations that are out there that, you know, those become your new holy grails. So my wife's always joking when I get a box in, she'll say, okay, what holy grail is it this week? 
because <laughs> it's now it's become holy grail of the week or the month <laughs> every time I get a box from Japan. So <laughs> I think I've I've more than used used that term into the ground. <laughs> I always have to say with a huge amount of gratitude and thanks to Maria Kwong who works with the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles, which is where you probably saw their show Kaiju vs. Heroes, where a lot of my collection was, was in that show. She really spearheaded and, and pushed forward not only my family and my story, about the internment and being Japanese American, but also that I learned my heritage through the toys, which is, you know, kind of an interesting concept. I guess all that to say, the toys have been in a few museum shows. The San Francisco airport had one. I think it's in the United Terminal. Um, they actually have a museum within those terminals that uh, passengers going back and forth can view and they had a, a show about Japanese toys a few years back yeah and you know occasionally uh, you know the the few magazines that are still around uh, will contact me and you know have a few of my pieces in there I think mostly people learn about my stuff now just through internet Instagram um, that kind of stuff uh, I, I mean I would love to participate in more museum shows because I mean I think a lot of times what you miss out in print or on your iPhone is that everything is flat. You don't get the dimensionality of these toys. You can't see behind them really, or you can't tell like their size. And then obviously light playing off of the different colors that they use um, on the paints and stuff. So it, it would be cool to uh, see these toys in, in, the, in real life. You know, just when I say, I think I'm done, I have it all, then the doorbell rings and another box shows up and I'm like, hey, you know, I gotta make some room and, and put some more figures in this cabinet. I think unfortunately I, I have the collector gene in me and so even if I feel like yeah, this is good. Like, you know, I, I, you know, for today it's done. I'm, I'm not going to buy any more. Yeah, it never ends. <laughs> and in terms of like saying, well, do I feel proud? I feel like I got into this because visually these things really appeal to my imagination and I loved looking at them. And I think that's really what's driven me to this point is, is just sort of curating my room to look a certain way, having artwork on the wall that relates to the toys. So I feel like, you know, the artwork and the toys and everything else in this room all reflect back on sort of my DNA of who I am as a collector and as an artist. So the best way to, uh, I guess, view my collections and and whatever's new in my room is to find me on Instagram, and that's uh, Max Toy Co. Or if it's something we've made through Max Toy Company, it'd be our website, maxtoyco.com. I think the other arc of collecting is just you get to a point where you realize what's really bringing you the joy is this era, right? Or this character and then you circle back to like, okay, I'm just gonna narrow in on that. I went through the whole phase of like grabbing everything, right? Ultraman toilet seat, Ultraman, you know, uh, whatever, Kleenex box. During the 2000s, Ultraman's like Spider-Man, Superman here where you could get tennis shoes, you could get, you know, whatever, underoos, you know, you get all that stuff. And I think at some point, the mania caught up with me and I was just buying anything Ultraman, right? People are gifting me anything Ultraman. And then I real, I look down and I see this box full of stuff and I'm like, I have no connection to this, right? It's like, it doesn't, um, again, it doesn't spark the joy to me that the vintage stuff does. And again, it goes back to 73 when I was first exposed to the older toys. So, so yeah, you know, that's, it's just, just the arc of being a collector, I think.
What, what's the most important lesson from Quick Black you learned? <laughs> wow. Okay. Make sure you have a very understanding spouse or girlfriend or boyfriend. <laughs> Try to stay within your budget. Because <laughs> it's very tempting to say, I'm just going to put this on the credit card and you know, and, and that's not good. Um, but yeah, I, I also just, you know, I, I'm very lucky that my wife, for the most part, is very patient with these giant things that come, <laughs> come into the room, so.